together on the first day of the week, and everything that we have done thus far um, has proved to God that we love Him and we love His Word, and that we have nothing else on our mind this morning. We'll be right here worshiping Him, singing praises to Him, and hearing a portion of His Word. That is a fact, and, and we have just proven that to a true ability. So let us all say amen. 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 <coughs> so we continue on repentance, while I have you all here, um, I would just like to read a couple of things that we should be aware of that can really, really help us as we go along. In this question, right now is to Christians. How many of you all swear? Curse. I didn't think I was going to have any hands. <laughs> Put their hands up. But we know you swear. We know you curse. S, D, F. All those words come out of some people's mouth. Right here. Mm -hmm. Now how in the world can you repent from something if, like David in Psalms 51, prior to Psalms 51, it is now a part of your lifestyle. Yes. Remember, Nathan had to go to David and tell David that you have moved along in the kingdom as if nothing ever happened with that sheep. And if we still cussing, we have moved along in the kingdom as if nothing has happened. Mm -hmm. Now for some people, swearing is hard. And for some people, they can stop swearing. They can just stop cussing. That's why y'all don't raise your hand. But do you know that swearing is a sin? Do you know cussing is a sin? So if God came back right in the middle of you cussing, are you going with God? I'm glad y'all saying no. Because some of us have convinced ourselves that God is going to overlook certain things. Yes. But if you, if God comes back and we are swearing, we are committing sin, the Holy Spirit is going to reveal that to Christ and Christ is not going to take us. Mm -hmm. Now I understand getting mad because Jesus got mad. I understand reacting to anger. But how in the world can you show somebody the godliness in you if you're going to act and respond just like them. Yeah. Uh -huh. Cursing in our way of describing words that are, for the most part, culturally or socially unacceptable. It is a slippery slope, however, to define a curse word because words are always taken, taking on new meaning. Some curse words in the English language are actually ah. authorized words to describe authentic things but have taken on new meaning as time has progressed. Because of this, it is nearly impossible to create a canonized list of words that are considered curses. Nevertheless, it can be concluded that there are words that are purely rude, crude, or demeaning, and are therefore inequivocal curse words. Mm -hmm. Scripture has much to say about how Christians ought to use their tongues. Jesus specifically taught that what comes out of a man's mouth is evidence of what is in a man's heart. Luke 6, 45. Mm. So if you're still cussing as a, as a Christian, it's in your heart. You just like to cuss people out. And when you get mad, you like swearing because you like that part of your vocabulary so the people that you are talking to can understand you mean what you get ready to say. Now, you and I can do that without using curse words. Because when Jesus got mad and turned the temple upside down, did he cuss the people out? No. Mm -hmm. No, he turned the temple upside down. Did it have the same meaning? Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can get somebody to understand that you're mad without calling them words. But nevertheless, Christians still swear. Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 4, 21, uh, 29, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. What is good for necessary edification that it may impart grace to the hearers. 
James gives us three illustrations from nature to, uh, to demonstrate the sinfulness of person. With our tongue, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse men mm -hmm. who have been made in the likeness of God. Mm -hmm. With the same mouth come both blessings and curses. Mm -hmm. My brother, these things ought not to be this way. Now, in the secular world out there, they call us hypocrites when we do certain things. And you know what? They should, because if we're acting like one, we should be called one. Yeah. And it's unfortunate, but some of us do act like hypocrite. But the biblical de definition of a hypocrite is defined as such. One who puts on a mask and friends himself to be what he is not. A member in religion, our Lord severely rebukes <coughs> scribes and Pharisees for their hypocrisy. So if you are something and you parading around to be something that you're not, you are a hypocrite. And people are calling you what they need to call. Mm -hmm. A hypocrite is a person who pretends to have virtues, moral, or religious beliefs and principles mm -hmm. that he or she does not actually possess. Them. Especially a person whose actions be lying stated. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we are either in this thing or we're out of this thing. But God is not playing. Mm -hmm. And you know, when we come together on the first day of the week and we hear portions of God's word, some of these sermons are going to help us and some of these sermons are going to hurt us and some of these sermons we're going to get mad because it's being brought forward. Because we're not just there. Okay? But in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, we have to remember about the book that we hold in front of us. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. So that means everything that we read and everything that is preached and everything that is taught out of the Bible comes from where? It comes from God. Mm -hmm. Now, it never came from the will of anybody sitting under these light bulbs. It came from God, okay? And what does it do? It is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So, when we hear certain things as sinful people that the Bible say we shouldn't do, it is for our own good. Mm -hmm. And remember that what's on the pages is not to be disputed by you and I. It is to be lived and believed so it can save our soul. Okay, now, the word of God became flesh and dwelled among men. So not only is it printed, it was lived among us. So God showed us the very nature of God through his son. Okay? So what you have in front of you, when you sit down and read it, you sit down and study it, just believe it mm. and live it. And you'll be fine with God. Because there's one thing God is not going to do with something that he created. He ain't going to argue you over what he just said. <laughs> and on Judgment Day, there'll be plenty of Christians that's going to go to God and say, but I didn't think you meant X, Y, and Z. Mm. Well, I didn't think that chapter and verse applied to me. And God is going to say in his thundering and lightning, who do you think you're talking to? I gave it through my son. I left it in word. And now you're standing before me. And this is one of the books that is going to be open that some of us as Christians are going to dispute. Now in Psalms 51... We examined that on Wednesday night. David's heart was changed. You wasn't there Wednesday night, so you missed that. His sin with Bathsheba, his crying out to God, changed 
Mm -hmm. When Nathan went to him and said, O oh, king, you're going along as if nothing is happening. Are some of us like that? Is there some yeah. things in your life that you simply routinely go along with mm -hmm. to the point right now where when you hear it in the Bible or you read it in the Bible, you are desensitized from it? Yeah. Man. You're just moving on with your life as if nothing is happening because you, mm -hmm. you have already accepted that particular thing in your life and you don't repent. Mm -hmm. Well, if you don't repent, God won't relent when it's time for forgiveness. Man. How in the world can grace cover us when we don't stop what we're doing? Mm -hmm. So it's only fair that when God comes back and he finds some of us that have been immersed in Christ doing worldly things, he's going to put us where he put the world. Amen. That's what he meant by when he says several times in the New Testament writings, Unbelievers are going to be standing before him. Yes. Amen. That's why he warned them in Revelation chapter 3. Go tell the region, them seven churches that I mean business. Now I'm just here to tell you this morning, stop wasting your time. Stop wasting your time on Sunday morning if you think this is a joke. You think you can come in here and do what you want to do, and you can go out there and live the kind of life you live. Just stop wasting your time. But I just want you to know, at some point, your heart is going to stop. Mm -hmm. Your heart is going to stop pumping. Mm -hmm. And after that, you're going to have to stand before God. Because what the devil didn't tell you in your historical life, that you were created to live forever. He didn't tell you. He didn't tell you that the death only ministers at funeral tell you that you're going to a better place. God didn't tell you you're going to a better place because the better place he's going to send you to is judgment day. And that's when he's going to examine your life and mine. And he's going to get to say where you go. Amen. And there's only two places that God has designed for humankind. That's with him and without him. Mm -hmm. And he designed it, y'all. I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, you'll be also. Now, there's a place that God is going to put us who don't believe, who give up, in a place where he's not going to be. And that place where God is not going to be is where God is not going to be. You want to know what that's going to be like? Die and go to hell. Amen. Think about it. Think about it. We owe God. How many of y'all in here, I know you will raise your hand now. How many of y'all been baptized? See, see, you have shown God through your obedience that you are willing to believe him and be where he is. Mm -hmm. So if we keep our act together and we keep it right, we're going on to be with the Lord. We're going on to be with the Lord. But those of us who have not, we are telling God through our everyday living, it doesn't matter what you say. It doesn't matter what you have planned. I'm all right. Mm -hmm. I'm all right. And I'm going to do it my way. Mm-hmm. We'll do it my way. Okay? Okay. All right. All right. Turn with me now to 2 um, Kings. That's not the sermon. That's not the sermon. 2 Kings chapter 21. 2 Kings chapter 21. Now, when you read 2 Kings, what I want you to do is read... Chronicles also. You have to read them both. So you're going to have to read uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 33. So I just want to show you what unrighteous living is like. Now if you have ever killed someone or rape someone, or you have ever been responsible for the death of someone, last Sunday meant a lot to you. This Sunday is going to mean a lot to you too. Now for those of us who haven't physically done those things, there's no measurement to sin. So last Sunday meant something to you too. And this Sunday is going to mean something to you too. Because God doesn't measure sin. That person that lies all the time to God is just like a murderer. That person who killed is just like a person who lied. 
In chapter 21 of 2 Kings, Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king. And he reigned 55 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was, and I'm going to mispronounce these, Hetzibah, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord according to the abomination of the nations whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. He rebuilt the high places which Hezekiah his father had destroyed. He raised up altars for Baal and made a wooden image as Ahab, king of Israel, had done. And he worshipped all the hosts of heaven and served them. He also built altars in the house of the Lord, of which the Lord had said, In Jerusalem I will put my name. He built altars from all the hosts of heaven in two courts of the house of the Lord. He made his own sons pass through the fire, practice soothsaying, using witchcraft and consulted spirits and medium. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. He even set a carbon image of Asherah that he had made in the house of which the Lord had said to David and to Solomon his son, in this house and in Jerusalem which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever. I will not make the feet of Israel wander any more from the land which I gave their fathers, only if they are careful to do according to all that I have commanded them, and going according to all the law that Moses served and commanded them. But they paid no attention, and it actually seduced them to do more evil than the nations which whom the Lord had destroyed before the children of Israel. And the Lord spoke by his servant the prophet, saying, Because Manasseh, king of Judah, has done these abominations, he has acted more wickedly than all the Amorites, and who were before him, has also made Judah sin with his idols. Therefore, thus says the Lord of Israel, Behold, I am bringing such calamity upon Jerusalem and Judah, that whoever hears of it, both his ears will tingle. I will stretch over Jerusalem the measuring line of Samaria and the plummet of the house of Ahab, and I will wipe Jerusalem as one wipes a dish, wiping it and turning it upside down. So I will forsake the remnant of my inheritance and deliver them into the hand of their enemies, and they shall become victims and plunder to all their enemies because they have done evil in my sight and have provoked me to anger since the day their fathers came out of Egypt, even to this day. <coughs> More of a Manasseh shed very, uh, very much innocent blood till he had filled Jerusalem from one end to the other besides his sin by which he made Judah sin in doing evil in the sight of the Lord. Mm. Isn't that a shame? Yeah. <laughs> now this is the king. He passed his own children through the fire. So Aaron would take AJ, and he would take Alex, and he would pass them through the fire. And we require the rest of these people to do the same thing. I never asked that. That's what he said in Jeremiah. He never asked that. Into a wooden image to something, and that's like, you know, he did this everywhere. He did wherever there was a hill, he put up an image of uh, these two gods. Even in the house of the Lord, where the house of the Lord put his name, he put and erected up all different kinds of things, even in the house of the Lord, that made the people sin. That made the people sin. And it destroyed the hearts and the minds of people. So you know what? Not only was the blood dripping from his hand for itself, the blood was dripping for everybody else too. For everybody else too. See, it's all right to die for what you did, but not what you're doing to somebody else. And he never said he was sorry until it was brought to his attention. And that's where repentance come in at. On Sunday mornings when you hear these things, do you get mad? Do you get mad at the speaker as a hearer? 
Are you in doubt? Do you contradict what the speaker says when he's reading these things out of the Bible? Do you really think speakers want to stand before you and tell you certain things that's going to upset you in the gospel? All scripture is given by inspiration that you and I can be corrected. The first thing we should do in prayer is say, God, feel forgive me and go home when we repent and stop doing those things that we just heard of if we guilty of those things. Yes, Lord. Amen. Because remember, according to uh, uh, the Old Testament writers, the person that speaks, if he don't speak to sinners and they don't change their ways, God is going to require that blood on his hand. But if yeah. he, he speaks to sinners and they don't do anything about their lifestyle, God is not going to say anything to the speaker. You're fine. You're all right with me because you told them. But if you don't tell them Christians, because guess what? We all are priests in Christ. So if we don't tell people of their wrong ways, God's going to require that out of us. Mm -hmm. See, that's why when I hear a minister say something, a preacher say something, I don't get mad. I take my little toes and I curl them up in my shoes and I go home and I get quiet. Yes. <laughs> and I start figuring out, figuring out calculated ways to change my life. Yes, Lord. To change my life. That's why I open up and I talk to you about swearing. There is no reason at all why you should be cussing people out when Jesus did. Amen. Because those are some of the things that we really, really struggle with. Mm -hmm. We struggle with the tongue. That's why on Wednesday night, you bring your lips, and I bring mine. And let's talk about the things that we knowingly do. Because how in the world can God forgive you when at the end of the day, you didn't say, Lord, forgive me for cussing? If you didn't ask God for forgiveness, how can he forgive you? Well, that means I got to be conscious of everything I say and do. Duh. Mm-hmm. You already know, and I already know that when we get into a heated argument with someone, we need to do like this. One, two. And we need to go like this. And we need to be quick to beep, 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 beep. Mm -hmm. Slow go. Beep, 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 beep. Because that's going to help us with what's going to come next. But if two logs are burning, what happens to the fire? Gets bigger. Somebody cuss at you, you cuss back at them. That's why I open up with that. So you can understand that the little things, not the major things, the little things that we're doing in our life can hinder us. Can hinder us. This man had did all these crazy kinds of things, and it was it was just it's outrageous. I got some historical stuff about this guy that I mean he you, 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 have to, you have to shake your head and say, you know, why? Why? He killed those who opposed his idolatrous ways. Jewish historians record Manasseh killing all kinds of people. It didn't make no difference to him when he got in his frenzy. The Ten Commandments, he obviously broke. No other gods before me. He had multitude of gods everywhere. No graven images. That's all they did was carve up stuff. They shall not commit murder. Well, he was killing his own sons and yours too. Mm -hmm. And worst of all, he led those under his rule astray. Yes. Yes. No. Knowingly, 2 Chronicles 33, 10 and 11, knowingly and willingly disobeyed God, but then he found God. Mm -hmm. So let's turn to uh, 2 Chronicles. Let's turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 33. Because in verse 10, this is when he started getting it right. Like I said, I can say some things to you and you can say, Ellis, man, you crazy. And you will walk away from me thinking I'm crazy and not pay me any money. But when God step in your path and knock you off your horse, you're going to know that you eat eating dust. Mm. You know you eat eating dust. And you ain't going to pay me no money. Well, that's just Ellis on this soapbox. I only have to tolerate that for 45 minutes. But see, when God stop you in the street, you're going to know it's God. Because God going to come in, he's going to make your body lift numb. He's going to scare you so much that your knees going to start knocking. See, 
I can't scare you that much. I can just say certain things to you where you have a cup of water or something down the hall when you're done. Mm-hmm. Verse 10 of 33. Now the Lord spoke to Manasseh and his people, but they would not listen. Prophets was telling them, but they would not listen. Therefore the Lord brought up of, of them the captains of the army of the king of Assyria, who took a Manasseh with books, bound him with bronze feeders, and carried him off to Babylon. Some of your versions say, uh, uh, put a hook in his nose and carried him around like this. King. King. Royalty. And when he was in affliction, he implored the Lord, his God, and humbled himself greatly before God and his father. See, the prophets couldn't tell him anything. You're not repenting over something that a human being is telling you. How many of us do that? We do that all the time in church. We know we did wrong this week as the brother looted on the Lord's table. But we take our communion and we go out here as if nothing ever happened. We don't care what the minister says. We go, we go right out of here and start doing the same thing we did before we came in here. But one of these days, God will put a hook around your nose. And I'm not talking about that African stuff. Mm-hmm. That you all wear with that cute little thing shining. I'm not talking about what looks good. I'm talking about something that's going to bend you to your knee. Now, just imagine, grab the inside. Well, don't do that here. But go home in the bathroom and take your two fingers and put it inside your nose and grip it. And imagine someone piercing the inside of your nose with a hook that you know if they pull hard, they will rip your nose away from you. Mm. Now, some women know these things. When they get in a fight, the first thing y'all do is pull on piercing. And what happens to piercings when you pull them? You pull the skin. You pull them right out. That's why you got to be very cautious about where you put earrings in piercing. You better be a very nice person and don't start no trouble. Because mm-hmm. that's going to be the first thing people pull is your body piercing. And it's going to hurt. Mm-hmm. But imagine being led around like that. Look what we just read right here. Being led around like that and knowing that as a king, you just been bound and you're now being humiliated off the Babylon. Now, when he was in his affliction, he implored the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before God and his father. And he prayed to him and he received his entreaty, heard his supplications and brought him back to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord was God. How many times as parents we have a stiff neck, hard headed kid that don't listen? You talk, you talk, you talk, you talk. You you just say this kid is brain dead. And then you start bringing bringing uh, blaming it on genetics. You say to the husband, it must come from your side of the family. <laughs> or the husband will say it must come from your side of the family. What did you what was your mom and dad like when you they was raising you? You start looking for answers. Because the kids are driving you crazy. They're not listening. Mm-hmm. But when you start disciplining those kids like this, and I'm not talking about abuse. When you start disciplining them like that, what happens? You start helping them to understand that things should be better when you speak. You need to listen to me when I speak for your own good. Amen. Now, don't raise your kids. Don't raise your kids. Let your children do what they want to do when they're newborn. And I guarantee you, and I can say this boldly, they will tell you off when they get to you. I'm talking to Christians. I ain't talking about the world. You just don't treat them the way God wants you to treat them. And see, don't they tell you off? Amen. Imagine that. I'm like Brother uh, uh, Charles when we was talking in Bible study. It ain't nothing in this world that I brought into this world that I won't take out. So in order to not be a murderer, I train my children. I train my son and my daughter so they don't disrespect me. And disrespect me in a manner where it looks like I never gave them training when they was growing up. Mm-hmm. And now I got to worry about them going to the juvenile brand new building right down the street here. Or North Avenue. Or Summers. Because that's where they're headed. 
put a ring around his nose, and that's when he understood that what the prophets was telling him to do, he shouldn't be doing. Amen. Imagine that. Every Sunday we get the same instruction. We take up the same Lord's Supper. And we don't have an abundance of prayer request cards after the sermon is over. So that means everything is all right. I say that every Sunday. Everything is all right. But we get mad if we don't speak to one another on Sunday morning. But we all right with everything else. Every one of these guys in Judah and Israel, as you read 1 Kings and 2 Kings, and I must control my emotions, every one of these guys were fired. Mm -hmm. And every one of them left a son. And the son was just like that. Isn't that horrible? Now imagine if he would have been like Hezekiah, and Hezekiah would have been like Jesus. He has no choice to be like his dad. If his dad is righteous, he's righteous. But if the dad is not righteous at home, something is going to turn out wrong in the milk. Mm -hmm. Because guess what? When the apple falls, it doesn't fall over where the oranges are growing. It falls under the same tree that produced it. Mm -hmm. Think about it. Think about it. When you read these things in First Kings and Second Chronicles, the sun was worse than dead. That new flavor came along, and them boys took that stuff to the next level. Prophet, priest, and king. God always has somebody to talk to these people. Yes. And when God got sick and tired of all that junk, he stopped those kings in their tracks. Yes. Turn to 1 Samuel. And I like the way God do the church. Because he's going to warn you. He's going to tell you before you even start. Turn to 1 Samuel chapter 8. This is what they demanded. They demanded these men. People demanded President Obama's and Bush's and, and all that. That's what they wanted. They don't want God to lead them as a nation. Turn to 1 Samuel, chapter 8. snatch these kids back. I'm telling y'all, man, we're going to have to snatch these kids back. We can't let them go out into the world acting like a nut. We can't. In verse 9, and therefore he therefore is, however, you shall solemnly forewarn them and show them the behavior of the king who will reign over them. So Samuel told all the words of the, uh, of the Lord to the people who asked him for a king. And he said, this will be the behavior of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them uh, for his own chariots and be his horsemen, and some will be, uh, come, will run before his chariot. He will appoint captains over thousands and captains over fifties, and will set to them plow his ground and reap his harvest, and some to make his weapons of war and equip meant for his chariot. He will take your daughters to be uh, perfumers, cooks, and bakers. He will take the best of your fields, your vineyard, now you know, you really don't like the IRS now, right? Your olive grove, and give them to your servants. He will take a tenth of your grain and your vintage and give it to his officers and servants. He will take your male servants, your female servants, your finest young men, and your donkeys and put them to his work. He will take a tenth of your sheep and you will be his servants. You will cry out in the day because of your king whom you have chosen from yourself and the Lord will not hear you in that day. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel and said, no, but we will have a king over us. Mm -hmm. And then you go back over here to 1 Kings and 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles and 2 Chronicles, and what happened? 
bow down and worship what? Wood. <clears throat> Who in here got a pencil? Anybody got a pencil? That's a pen. You got a pencil?
time to do with it. And you know what we say? That's not what she wants. I know what my wife wants. But why is your wife telling other wives what she don't get? <laughs> Satellites tomorrow. <laughs> we talk about premium gas. Yes. We talk about four cylinders and six cylinders. <laughs> Wives are talking about the children yes. and what they don't get at home. And you know what we say among men? My wife's happy. Mm -hmm. I know if y'all been tying me up, y'all been tying me up. But you know what? I have to listen to it too. Because Sister Sam is no hypocrite. You say, for what reason? Because the Lord has been witness between you and the wife of your youth, with whom you have dealt treacherously. Yet she is your companion, your wife by covenant. But did he not make them one having a remnant of the spirit? And why one? He seeks godly offspring, church. Therefore, take heed to your spirit and let none deal treacherously with the wife of their youth. You just think y'all just got married and had kids. Don't you know today, 2012, there are women out here begging to have what you neglect? Begging for someone to put a bundle of joy in their arms and you don't even pay your child no mind? Begging to, 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 to take your children. You give me your children, I can have children. Just give me what you start. Don't you know there are women today that are begging for that? Amen. And you won't treat your son with godly respect because God already told you what he wanted? You're not going to train your son and daughter and God already told you what he wanted produced because he blessed the womb? Isn't that amazing? But yet, you and I as parents are going to be just like Manasseh. We're going to read, because remember, he had a son, and his son's coming next. And guess what the son is going to do? The same thing, because that apple don't fall far from the tree. How in the world can Solomon have one wife when David had many? And what did Solomon do? He took it to the next level. I guess women got prettier, because he had more. You see? I am, Ellis is a product of me. Erica is a product of me and Don. I pray for him all the time. All the time I pray for him because you know why? I know how I am. Imagine that. I know how Donna is. Donna know how she is. We pray for our children all the time. We got to save our children, y'all, because in doing that, we are saved the church. We got to go get them. We got to take them and shake them and turn them in front of the mirror and say, God loves you. Forgive me for not being the father that I was. Forgive your mom for not being the mom that she was. Don't listen to the stupid things we say in this house. Believe God. Please Amen. forgive me. That's what we need to say. Because on judgment day, trust me when I tell you, on judgment Amen. day, don't think for one minute because you was immersed, on judgment day when that boy is standing before God, he's going to walk up to you as a father and say, you didn't do what I told you to do. Amen. And the reason he's going to hell is because of you. Amen. You had him 18 years. And he's out there running amok. Yeah. What did he do to Eli? Mm. He took the boys out the boys. and the father. Mm. You think God would have let, let us as men get away with destroying life? Yeah. Don't you know if you cuss, he going to cuss too? Yeah. Don't you know if you smoke, he going to smoke too? Yeah. Don't you know if you yell at his mom, abuse his mom, call his mom all kinds of names, he going to do that to somebody else's daughter, and it better not be mine. Because yeah. 
Because what you couldn't do as a dad, I'm going to do as a father-in-law. Because yeah. I'm going to yoke that boy. You thought he was too good to be touched, just like David did Absalom. He was cute. He was fine. He had long hair. He had all the women, just like dad. But he wanted even his dad's women. Rotten to the core. And what God did with his afro got him caught in a trap. He wasn't cute to God. And what was David doing? Set false and ashes. Absalom. Oh, Absalom. When that news came back, he said, It's done. See? That's what I said. These scriptures are written to inspire us. And as a parent, if you don't believe this, stop coming here. Stop. Just stop coming here because I'm going to tell the truth and I'm going to make you mad all the time. <laughs> because I have to tell myself this. As long as you're dad, your children are going to be your children. You have a right to tell them what to do to the day they die. Stop letting the United States tell you that at 18 years old, you ain't got nothing to do with your children. Stop letting the government tell you that. God never told you that. He never told you that. As a father, you got the right to tell him what to do to the day he dies. If he don't like it, tell him to stop coming to the house. Come around here looking like you ain't got no business here. I'm going to tell you you don't belong here. Mm. Walking here with your pants all down, your hair not combed, stinking and everything. Walking in here with all kinds of looking women that don't look like your mother. I didn't marry nobody like that. Don't you be bringing nobody in my house to look at me. Hey, Mr. Stanley, how you doing? Uh. That's what happened at the door. Not on this side. You crazy? I'm not. You sinning? I'm not. I wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning in my house, and Elsa and Eric, they got everybody downstairs. They throwing down. They got the second floor. <laughs> Donna said, what's that? I said, I don't know. That's your son and your daughter. <laughs> well, I can tell you what. You get down there and stop this, man. I'm coming downstairs with some firepower. They're going to be firecrackers. <laughs> Up and out. Everybody. Because that's what it's going to come to. Right? I just proved it to you. That's what it's going to come to. These boys are going to act just like you. And they're going to take it to their generation and to their level. They all. I have no tattoos on me. The Bible says in the Old Testament, I am the Lord your God. I just showed you that he said in Malachi 2, I never changed. I didn't put nothing carving on me. You know why? I wanted to. I did. You know, I seen some things that my friends was getting when we turned 18. We used to go, I used to go with them to tattoo shop because I had my license and I had to call. And there were several things I wanted. You know? But I was still living at home. Mm. And Robert Stanley didn't have no tattoos. Irene Stanley didn't have no tattoos. And it wasn't a discussion in our house about tattoos. You act like your mom and dad. So I knew in order to get a tattoo, I had to move out of the state of Connecticut, move out of the house, and when I came around, make sure the tattoo was covered. Because when my mom or my dad seen the tattoo, I could be 35. And my dad will try to take the tattoo off wherever he seen. So I had to be cautious about where I put the tattoo. <laughs> you want to do what you want to do. Your parents think it's cute because you got your freedom and your liberty. Well, God don't. God don't. Half of these people out here got stuff carved on them that is so offensive to God, when it thunder and lightning, they be the first one scared. You don't even know what that stuff is. All that Japanese stuff and all that, Middle East stuff and all that, you English and don't know what that means. You can be cussing somebody out with that tattoo and don't tattoo and don't know it. What you think is cute because everybody else is doing it. Okay? All right, I just proved to you. 
I hope I said something this morning that will make you examine this story in First and Second Kings and Second Chronicles and go back and look at it. And please, let's come Wednesday night with those comments because I'm gonna bring mine. You know, and let's talk about these things. Let's talk about them. You actually do. Don't you know that some of you, when you talk to me, you swear. From now on, I'm going to tell you that because some of y'all looking at me. And some of y'all that looking at me was the ones that was squaring when you was talking to me. You didn't even know you were saying the S word and the D word. Because it's just part of who you, how you talk. So from now on, I'm going to say, you know what? Oops. Mm -mm. Soak it out. <laughs> because you have, you've gotten in a pattern that these things are all right. And the reason why those things are all right, because you do them every day. But if Jesus would come back while you're swearing, would he say soap in the mouth? No. no. Right. How in the world can you get somebody to see the Jesus in you when you're acting just like that? Man. They can't see the Jesus in you. That's right. You notice know y'all didn't say amen that much today? <laughs> You think I didn't notice that? Yeah. I used to cuss like a sailor. I used to cuss people out. Matter of fact, I used to wait till I can find people to cuss out. <laughs> and I called them everything under the sun. Mm. Look, every minute of it, then I would wait and see the expression on their face. <laughs> yeah, I said it. Yeah. Want me to say it again? <laughs> And I'm not boasting and I'm not putting myself on a pedestal, but ask them how many times they heard me swear. You know how hard that was for me to do. Amen. You think Don and I had a perfect marriage where everything went right? Ask them. They sitting up here on the first row. You know how hard that was? Mm -hmm. You think I'm telling you something because I think I'm all great and I think I got it all together? I still have to control myself, y'all. 30 and 27 years old and they still don't hear me swear. You know how hard that you think I can get mad? Y'all think Ellis and Erica don't make me mad? I know. <laughs> <laughs> Tell you that it's 
all right what you do. Don't worry about it. God's going to forgive you. How can God forgive you for something that you don't repent of? <laughs> Think about it, brothers. And if the church, God is desiring godly offspring, uh, how is God going to take that if we don't become that? Mm -hmm. Remember, the women can't run the church, man. God doesn't allow that. Raise your hand and pray it if you need it. I got to change. I got to change. LSU, right? You right? Who can you send me to? I got to change. I got to go home. I got to change. Honey, I'm sorry. And for you wives who have been made up in your mind that your husband's behavior is all right, you send him to. You send him to because you are allowing it. Yeah. You allowing it. And guess what? The responsibility of those children is on two people. If he don't do it, you got to do it. Lois and Eunice did it. Yeah. So if your children are not becoming godly children, you're just as at fault as the husband. And the same blood that's dripping from his hand is dripping from yours. You birthed them. Amen. You birthed them. You carried them nine months. Amen. And you need to tell me you're going to do just like your husband when well, you're going to be in the same hell he's in. Amen. Think about it. Think about it. Because I know wives that are like that. Whatever my husband say goes, okay. 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 All right. All right. All right. I got nothing else to say. If that's the way you feel and that's what you believe in you and your action, okay. If God wants that child to be something, that child is going to be something. But he's going to hold you accountable for it. So go ahead. Go ahead. And I'm just dying for one of you brothers to come up to me afterwards and say something. Oh, Ellis, I, I believe it's something you're going to say to me. Prove it in the Bible. Prove me wrong. Prove me wrong. You go and you look at 1 Kings and 2 Kings and 1 Chronicles and 2 Chronicles and look at the behavior of those men and their sons. <coughs> That even some of the grandfathers were still around. You look. Go and look at David and look at Solomon. Look at these things. And then look at your son and look at your daughter. Look at Alex Aaron. Look at Alex. Look how many more years, Captain, he's going to be in this house. And remember, at 18 years old, they're gone. They're gone. Look at them. Look at them. And that is because of you and I. And if we don't repent of these things, he's done. he's done. Satan is already standing outside waiting on him. And he's waiting on you and I as parents to make a godly mistake. Because he got young kids his age killing themselves. Think about it. Mm -hmm. Think about it. I don't want to talk about NASA. I don't want to talk about Carlos. I want to talk about Ellis. I want to talk about Daniel. I want to talk about Brian. That's what I'm going to talk about. I want to talk about the future of the church. That's what I'm going to talk about. And don't get caught and bothered with me because that's what I want to talk about. Amen. We can't afford to lose the church, y'all. God's going to blame us for it. Amen. In Acts 2.38, God made it perfectly clear when Peter and those 11 apostles got up and stood up and they said, you know, men and brothers, we got something to say here. You know, this Jesus who was here in the flesh, you know what you did? You crucified him. You murdered him. You really, really did. And you know what? They had every authority to say that because you know what? They did too. They did too. They left, they ran. And don't you know the 11 ran before Peter did? And that when uh, Peter looked at Jesus, what did he do? Swear at that girl and left too. But during the resurrection, what did Jesus do? And this is the part that I like when repentance come in. He cooked them breakfast on the seashore. Peter was the first one to jump in the boat and swim. His mother one tied the boats up and came to Jesus. Peter was already talking to Jesus. You know what Jesus said? Done? Jesus had forgave them because this came. And you know what happened after that? They stood up in that whole nation of people and told them all what everybody had done. And in verse 36, therefore, let all the house of Israel know for surely that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. See there? You see that repentance? You see where it comes from? You see that? You see that? I just want you to see that. So on Wednesday night when we started talking, all those people who were murderers were cut to the heart. 3,000 let it pierce their heart. You're right. You're right. I don't want to be guilty of this. And you know what? And I want you to study this. So when I start preaching about it and talking about it, you will understand. Jesus pronounced a woe on Jerusalem. Go back and read it in Luke. Mm -hmm. And in 70 AD, 
Jesus, not the Roman government, I know what history said, Jesus took Jerusalem down to the ground. Mm. And the very same people that crucified him died within that city. They killed one another. They starved them out. The, the Romans starved them out. Go read the history of 70 AD. Jesus got them back for what they did to him. 3,000 people was what pierced to the heart. That's what God knows. I don't know that God knows that. You can tell me anything, but God knows that. And said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what should we do? There's the proof of them being sorry. Mm -hmm. Sorry, what should I do? What should I do? You can say anything you want to say, but your action is going to speak loud in your words. What shall I do? And then Peter said to them, repent. We just talked about it. And that every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promises to you and to your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord God will call. Mm -hmm. You see, God is going to give his spirit to somebody who's not serious. Mm -hmm. Now, you got to keep his spirit, but they were serious enough to receive it. Every Sunday morning, that's what I say to you and up Who's ever up here talking says the same thing to you. So you will know what God requires. Yeah. But after it's said and done, there may be some in the audience that have lived this week, just like it was uh, uh, spoken to us uh, by Brother Kelly. You have may have lived this week with all that time given to you, and in the last six days you sinned. Matter of fact, your lifestyle has been that of sin. You can't even pray for yourself because you're to the point right now in six days that you don't know what to say to God. Mm -hmm. But someone in here that is righteous that hasn't gone through the things that you've gone through this week, who've been righteous, you know what they do? They'll pray for you. And that's the category that you will find yourself in. Brothers and sisters, don't play with it. Members, friends, whoever you are, don't, you don't have to come here on a Sunday morning and hear this and don't listen. You don't have to. Honestly, you do not have to. Don't waste your time. Don't waste your time. That world out there, it's going to kill you, but it got a lot to offer. The wages of it is death. It is you're going to die, but you might as well die being a happy sinner. Mm. Why be a so-called Christian who's going to die upset because he couldn't sin? Go sin. You're going to die anyway. The devil got you thinking that you're not going to die. He got you thinking that everything's all right in your life because you won't repent. But guess what? You're going to die anyway, so we're going to have the gusto. There's a lot of gusto out there. Five minutes to one. Y'all probably be just rolling out here. Going to get your Dunkin' Donuts in your bed. <laughs> and then listen to me for an hour. Think about it. Just think about it. The song has been prepared for us. The message has been given. The story is there. I didn't put a subject on it because I wanted you to listen to the story. Go to uh, Kings, go to Chronicles, and read the story. So the story can be the subject. Okay? This way you can see what the father did just like the son. And then you can see just how he repented after he was led around with a nose hook. You can see just what brought him to his knees. So you will know when you go home, you need to say to God in your prayer room, I got to change Ellis. I got to change Ellis. You have said it too many times to me. I got to change Ellis because my family is at stake. That's what these, what these uh, 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 um, scriptures are about. Now the song has been prepared. Uh, it's 947. Let us stand and sing.